Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm ready to roll. A reminder, this is plural, but in fact, there's one. What we uh, discussed or proved or outlined the proof is that uh, if you have a manifold, which is isotropic at every point, then it is homogeneous, but then isotropic at every point homogeneous is maximally symmetric. And maximally symmetric means that the dimension of the group of isometries of Mg is equal to this number, the dimension of M times dimension of M plus one over two. And uh, where are we heading? Uh, so the overall L, uh, L uh, the overall aim is to derive the um, Friedman uh, Lemaitre Robertson Walker metric. which looks like that. So if I start not being able to write the Friedman metric correctly, then doesn't promise I'm too good for today, but uh, well, let's hope for the best. So uh, this is a number which is zero, one or minus one. This is called the scale factor. And this is the metric which is supposed to uh, describe the universe. So F, L, R, W metric. And uh, uh, let's see. So probably Friedman and Lemaitre were the first ones to derive it. Then Robertson Walker followed. Uh, somehow Robertson Walker popularized it in the US speaking um, area. So in many references, this metric will uh, be listed as Robertson Walker. And uh, I don't want to say each time F L R W because it's just terrible to say. So I will probably say Friedman metric uh, just for simplicity. But, um, uh, and he was probably the first one really historically to, to write it down. And this is the metric which is supposed to describe our universe at larger scale. And this is the metric which works. So fits the data. So no matter how naive and how simple it is, it works. And so that's nowadays cosmology with a few add-ons to this. So Einstein equations are used to determine this, uh, uh, how uh, this function R of T looks like. All right, so the whole metric has been reduced to one function and we put it in the Einstein equations and well, and the Einstein equations will tell us how this evolves. Well, today we're actually interested in this part of this metric. So I don't think we'll go, well, hopefully we'll get to this part, but the first aim today is, uh, is just to derive this. So the question is, uh, how do maximally symmetric Riemannian metrics look like? Well, the, la the answer is, is in front of you. And uh, that's what we're going to do, right? So let's call this uh, one. 
And um, so what we want to do is justification of one. Then eventually we have, hopefully today we're going to justify two as well, two being the whole thing, right? So we have a space-time metric, which has this maximally symmetric space part and uh, has this global uh, presentation. So I've already told you last time what's the idea. Uh, we look at the uh, induced metric induced on uh, the manifold, let me call this sigma A, is eta, um, well, let me use indices like that, x mu, x nu is equal A, which is a subset of Rn, with a metric eta, and eta has constant entries, constant entries. And we are going to be interested in two cases where eta is the flat metric, Riemannian flat metric, or uh, where eta is the Minkowski metric. We could look at more general cases as well, and it is interesting too, but uh, I don't think we'll have time to discuss those. So, uh, so what is the induced metric? We already discussed this in the context of, um, of, of the flam paraboloid. But let me repeat how this goes. So uh, induced metric on, uh, on these uh, sigma A's, right? So on sigma A. So this is going to be the metric you define H of x, y is equal uh, just to eta x, y. So this is a rather trivial things. If x, y are tangents to uh, sigma, sigma i. So, so in other words, the uh, environing metric eta is defined for all uh, vectors, but you're saying, well, I'm going to only to restrict this to vectors tangent to uh, sigma, and that's the definition of my induced metric. So how does it work in practice? Uh, so let's specialize now eta is going to be uh, an epsilon, which is uh, uh, plus minus one. times dw square plus a flat metric. Uh, and now we have to be careful about dimensions. So this is going to be um, n-dimensional. So uh, this is in n plus one. I should have written immediately, right? So, so sigma a has dimension n. And, and n is going to be three for us. We're interested in three-dimensional maximally symmetric metrics because that's the space part of the cosmological metric, but uh, the argument work in any dimension. So, uh, so we want n equal three, and therefore this larger space um, manifold is n plus one. So, so this is our eta. Uh, so if I put uh, uh, polar coordinates on, on spherical coordinates, this is going to be epsilon d omega square plus uh, dr square plus r square d omega square. Well, this is a metric, right? So this is, this part is here. And this is, a metric on a n minus one dimensional sphere, right? So metric on s n minus one. 
included in R n. Yeah, so one has to be a little careful with the dimensions here. This is dimension n plus one. So this is n, uh, this is n because I've already removed one dimension by introducing a coordinate dw. And uh, because this is n dimensional, this sphere will be n minus one dimension. So if n equals three, then this is a two dimensional sphere and this is a three dimensional matrix. Uh, good. So uh, we're going to, well, I write it again if needed. I have to remember that this is one and this is two, but hopefully I. Obviously, I shouldn't have removed my reminder, but uh, good. Too late now. It's going to melt anyway, so. So let's see. So now uh, sigma A is given by this equation here. Uh, so in uh, spherical coordinates, uh, this is going to be, this is the position vector. So it's going to be epsilon uh, W square uh, plus R square is equal uh is equal a okay so now if x is a, a tangent to sigma a then uh, this means that uh, x acting on this function here is zero right because uh, we have this function which defines uh, so let's see, think of this as being F, right? So this is F equals A. So if X is tangent, it means that when you're moving along X, you're staying on the surface. So it doesn't change the function that you're uh, looking at. So this means therefore that uh, well, which is the same as saying that the differential of this function acting on X is zero. And the differential of this function is uh, two epsilon W dW plus uh, two R dR acting on X is zero. So, this means that when I have this one form acting on X, it always gives zero. In other words, I can write that dW plus two R dr is zero on tangent vectors. So if I'm trying to evaluate this on tangent vectors, I have this formula, which means that I can eliminate uh, dW from my metric uh, when I'm using this formula, right? So dW is then minus, well, the two cancels out. 
uh, R over epsilon W uh, minus R epsilon W dr when acting on tangent vectors. And I'm interested in epsilon dW square, but so uh, dW square is, if I square this, epsilon is plus minus one squares to one. And W square, I can calculate from here. So epsilon W square is equal A minus R square. So if I multiply by epsilon, epsilon square is one. So I get W square is epsilon A minus R square. So uh, this is R square epsilon A minus R square the R square. So now my, met my induced metric H is therefore epsilon DW square. So epsilon cancels out R square over A minus R square, the R square plus the R square here plus R square the omega square. Um, well, so let's uh, just do some algebra. So this is R square from here plus A minus R square over A minus R square from this one, right? So this is uh, the one here. So, uh, yes, yeah, so the R square cancels out, and we get this metric H is uh, dr, A dr square, A minus R square plus R square d omega square. And the manifold is uh, sigma A defined by this formula. And so if I just take this formula here, W square is equal epsilon A minus R square. So this is where we arrived. So let me just make sure that this is a uh, maximally symmetric, maximally symmetric. So we have uh, 
sigma a was also defined as eta uh, so, so eta alpha so eta mu nu x mu x nu is equal a and we are and r a and uh, this metric eta is invariant under um, so the eta is invariant under the whole isometry group of Rn with this metric, but in particular under SO eta. So that's going to be uh, linear transformations. So this is going to be, say, a lambda from Rn plus one to Rn plus one. Uh, and I'm no translations here. So X goes to lambda X period. And invariance means that uh, uh, eta of lambda star x lambda star y is equal eta of x y. And uh, so this looks a bit like the equation uh, we are used to uh, for the um, for Lorentz matrices for the Lorentz group, except for this star here, right? So this star is uh, not what you're used to. So let me just make sure that this is what you are used to, even though you don't know that this is what you are used to. So this is our map here, uh, uh, which. Uh, maps Rn plus one to Rn plus one. So what is a lambda star, right? So lambda star of a vector X acting on a function F is X acting on F of lambda X. Let's say this point, at the point X. which is x mu, well, uh, acting on a composed function. So we just need, need to do d mu f, so d over dx mu. times the derivative of the argument, so d, uh, Uh, how should I write this? Maybe I should write it like that, right? Um, let me just do it carefully so that I... Yeah, so we want to do the uh, terrible, terrible. So we want to calculate... Uh, derivative of a composition of functions. So uh, we calculate we calculate the derivative of the f with respect to its argument, right? So df over dx mu. Now, and the argument is d. Um, oh, yeah. So th this is what I was doing wrong. We calculate the derivative of f with respect to its argument, right? And the derivative of the argument, which is lambda alpha beta x beta over, good. Okay, so this is what I was, what I was supposed to do, okay, good. So, well, uh, I'm going, I have to erase all this. I don't need any thing here. I need this one. Uh, so maybe you can meanwhile finish this calculation to work out what lambda star, what the push forward of the vector X is. And that essentially this lambda star, you can think of this as being the same as lambda, at least at the level of linear maps. 
of course, geometrically it means something different, but uh, the formula we end up is essentially the one you know from special relativity. And I'm writing lambda here, but of course this could be, uh, if uh, eta is the Euclidean met uh, Riemannian metric, uh, so Euclidean metric on, uh, on our end, then this would be rotation rather than the, than the Lorentz matrix. But I mean, the calculation is the same, right? So if I calculate this, of course, I'm going to get a delta delta beta mu. So this is x mu lambda alpha mu uh, df over dx alpha which means that lambda star of x alpha is lambda alpha mu x mu. So this is the formula, the same formula that x uh, alpha is lambda alpha mu x mu. At the level of coordinates, this is just a linear transformation. And because this the derivatives are constant. The Jacobi matrix is just this derivative. So the action, the push forward of a vector is just formally the same formula as, as this, right? So, so this equation now is the same as saying that, uh, so if we put number three here, then three is the same as saying that eta mu nu, lambda mu alpha, lambda, New beta is eta alpha beta. I if I just remove the vectors here. Uh, so so these are uh, if um, eta is uh, uh, the flat matrix or so Euclidean, then lambda is uh, orthogonal element of the group, and if eta is the Minkowski, then this is the Lorentz group, O, 1, N, 1, 3, Lorentz group. Good. So, and uh, of course, uh, how many do we have of them? Uh, so we know, uh, so this is calculation we did already, so I'm not going to repeat it, that uh, lambda, uh, if I take this matrix and I lower in its indices, so lambda mu nu is anti-symmetric. So the space of this uh, uh, set of matrices is maximal. Dimension is, well, okay. It's maximal. Uh, well, this is an n plus one times n plus one matrix. So the dimension of such matrices is n plus one times n plus one minus one over two, right? Which is n, n plus one over two. So of course, if I only take the linear part of the whole Poincare group, I don't get the maximal isometry group of Rn plus one, right? I only get part of it. But this is good enough to have a maximal isometry group for our submanifold, right? Because n now is dimension n, yeah. And so the set, the dimension of the set of these matrices is exactly the maximal uh, number needed for here. Good. So. Uh, if we have these matrices, which satisfy this, then sigma A is invariant. Uh, it, it's obvious by the definition, right? So and, and I will write it again, but, uh, but it's obvious from the definition of sigma A. And the induced metric is invariant, which is uh, essentially obvious, but still, it's good to have a formal proof, so we're going to write it down.
So, uh, so now eta is invariant, right? So obviously, lambda maps sigma a to sigma a. And if I look at lambda star of h, So this is now the pullback map. Uh, if I act on two vectors x, y tangent to sigma to sigma a, then this is by definition h of the push forward of x, push forward of y. But h is defined as a Minkowski metric. On, on these things. So H is just Minkowski metric, but restricted to vectors tangent to sigma, right? But the Minkowski metric is invariant. So we also have uh, that, yeah, so sigma A H is invariant under uh, O of eta, which has the maximal dimension. So what else could we say here? Uh, well, we could say that I'm cheating a little bit, but I'm not going to explain you where is the, there's a gap here. Uh, so you just figure it out. Yeah, there's a gap, a small gap in the argument. Well, whether it's small, Every gap is a, a gap, right? So there's a small gap in the argument, you figure it out. Uh, but it's almost, it's almost a complete argument. Here. If someone has a, an idea why there is a gap here, then please unmute yourself and feel free to share. But I'm not going to explain this. So we have our maximally symmetric manifold, and we already wrote the metric. Uh, let's just uh, make it a little more specific so that. that we see what happens when you change uh, uh, epsilon and when you change uh, this metric eta. Because so now our metric eta had uh, two possibilities and epsilon was plus minus one. Uh, so, uh, and also we didn't say what A is. A could be positive or negative would make a difference. So let's have a look at that. So the case epsilon equal one is uh, simplest. Then uh, let's see. Then we have w square plus r square is equal a. So it better be that a is uh, positive. So let's take a equal r square. 
So this is a sphere in Rn plus one. And the metric is, well, it's here, so there isn't much that I can say more about it. I will say a little more about it shortly. But uh, so, so how should we uh, view this, right? So we have eliminated W. So if W is here, and this is our sphere, right? So I can think of this as being, when written like that, it's kind of half a sphere. Well, if you get uh, uh, one half uh, when W is positive, another half when W is negative, right? So somehow W has vanished from this equation, but it is implicit in the definition. So this is not quite the sphere, but the half sphere when written like that, but... Uh, Next, uh, and when epsilon is one, uh, we don't have much choice, other choice, right? So this has to be positive. But when epsilon is one minus one, uh, we can choose A equal R square. So A will be positive. Uh, then what happens with this equation? Uh, let me rewrite it. Uh, carefully, so W square is equal minus R square minus R square. So what's a good way of writing it? Uh, so this is R square minus R square. So probably it's better to write R square is equal W square plus R square, right? Then R should be louder than R. And if we make a, a picture where W is here, uh, and so this is telling us that we can graph R as a function of W, right? So this is going to be a hyperboloid like that. And R is larger than R. So if I look at the metric H, I'm going to get, well, R square here over R square minus R square, the R square plus R square the omega square. And this is negative. Did I have it right? Did I do it right? <laughs> Let, let's check this carefully, right? So epsilon is minus one. This is here. Uh, A is R square. This is here. Minus R square was here all the time. And this formula is correct, right? So, so, so we had epsilon W square plus R square is equal A. So R square to this side, yeah. So everything looks okay to me now. So this means that, uh, well, R is time here, right? So we have a, a time coordinate. So this is actually a Lorentzian manifold. Right? So Lorentzian manifold now. And with this parametrization, uh, so if we just could, uh, call R goes to T, then you're going to get that H is uh, minus, still 
perplexed, but uh, I think it's correct. That's not what I was expecting to get, but okay. T square times R square plus T square D omega square. And this is called the Decitor metric. Something funny happening here is T at uh, uh, at t equal r, but I don't, yeah, that's, I think, a coordinate problem thinking, okay. So maybe that's an exercise for you, right? So uh, what happens when t equal r, right? So is this a singularity? Or is this a, a coordinate singularity or? Uh, the answer is it is a coordinate singularity. Uh, good. So, so that's, uh, as you see, this construction gives you also Lorentzian manifolds, not only Riemannian ones. We are more, mostly interested in Riemannian one. And this is maximal, maximal symmetric Lorentzian uh, manifold. Uh, so, uh, which is uh, has some interest in its own. And it's irrelevant for uh, our cosmological considerations at this stage. But, uh, well, it is there. So I don't need it anymore, so I'm going to erase it. So still epsilon equal minus one. And A equal minus R square now. Um, good, so A is equal minus R square. Uh, so let's see, so uh, we take our equation here. Uh, the difference will be in the sign here, right? So A was R square. Now it's uh, minus R square. So we get W square is equal R square plus R square. And now we get a hyperboloid again. And this was a hyperboloid, but the, a, a, another one. So we get uh, this one. Two branches, right? So another one, another branch here. So this is supposed to be a invariant under rotations, maybe. Not completely clear, but 
with a little imagination, you should realize that this is invariant under rotation. All right, so two branches, W equal plus minus, and so here is a, a minus R, and here is, a, somewhere here is a W equal R. So that's uh, the metric, and now, uh, If we look at H, is going to be A is now negative, so it's minus R square over minus R square minus R square D R square plus R square D omega square. So the minuses cancel out and you get uh, R square D R square over R square plus R square plus R square D omega square. And this is called hyperbolic metric or hyperbolic space. I don't have time to do this, but just on, uh, but on the base of symmetries or, or, or some other, the Riemann tensor must have a very simple form. Uh, which is, uh, so the Riemann tensor must also be maximally symmetric. What else uh, if, uh, so you can, the argument is, therefore we can build it out from the metric because otherwise there'll be something exterior to the metric which enters in the problem and which will break the symmetry. So it must be of the form G. And uh, so, uh, something which is has the right symmetries built out of the metric so there's only one possibility up to a constant alpha gamma beta delta right four indices you need two metrics two metrics you can't have g alpha beta terms because g alpha beta is symmetric this is anti-symmetric so you can have g alpha gamma terms but then you have a beta delta one and then because this is anti-symmetric in gamma and delta, you just need to anti-symmetrize and you know that the Riemann tensor must look like that times a constant here. And kappa is a sectional curvature or called sectional curvature. And uh, it's a constant because the metric is the space time is homogeneous, right? So uh, homogeneity implies that kappa is a constant. Oh, you can also show from second Bianchi that has to be constant, but, but just from homogeneity, you know that it is a constant. And so the hyperbolic metric will have kappa negative. Uh, it's negatively curved. And the sphere will have kappa equal positive. Uh, it's positively curved. And so kappa equal, of course, here. So, so the two metrics of interest, uh, so this is interesting. This, uh, the Cita space is interesting too, but we don't care about it because it's not. Riemannian at this stage. For cosmology, we need this maximally symmetric Riemannian matrix. And uh, now we have all of them. So now summarizing H is equal R square dr square R square minus. In this case, uh, 
we had minus r square on the sphere. And we have a plus r square on hyperbolic space. So let me put a number here, minus k r square, where k is uh, plus one for a sphere, minus one for hyperbolic space. And uh, let's see, you can probably uh, put in for free equals zero for flat. Okay. So uh, that's um, a case which didn't show up here, but the flat case is obviously uh, covered by this. Uh, is immediately, we get immediately the maximally symmetric flat solutions uh, by k equals zero. And uh, well, there's one other uh, change of coordinates, which is typical in this, uh, uh, for this kind of metrics. If you just replace R by R times R, so here we're going to get an R square, R square. Here we're going to get an R square, R square. Here we're going to get an R square, R square. So H, let's see, we have an R square, we already had one. And with this one, uh, well, this one, we can just cancel it out with, with these two, right? After this rescaling, but there's one left from here and there'll be another one left from here. This metric, we're going to call it HK. And these are, this is an explicit formula for maximally symmetric Riemannian metrics constructed by this way. Uh, there is a, an interesting twist to this. Uh, which has to do with the fact that you can take quotients. So here, these manifolds were particularly simple. We just got a, either a sphere in Rn or just a plane or a um, hyperboloid. Uh, but you can take quotient of these things to get more complicated topologies. When you take a quotient by a discrete subgroup of the Lorentz of, of the isometry group, the metric locally still looks like that but globally it's going to be different, right? So it's especially interesting in this uh, hyperbolic case where you can get very pretty pictures. Uh, I encourage you strongly to look it up on, on the uh, internet. Uh, for example, there's this famous uh, fish uh, uh, picture by Escher, which uh, is a, uh, you have a disc filled by fishes, which are smaller and smaller as you go uh, nearer to the boundary or, or, or birds. And uh, this has to do with existence of hyperbolic discrete isometries of the hyperbolic space. Uh, good. But uh, this is uh, for us, this is the local version, which is of key interest. So, so now, uh, we're almost ready to do cosmology. We still have to go from this representation of the space metric to the space-time metric. And to do this, uh, we're finally going to start a new section with a little help of Eva. Um, 6.1.7. Okay. No, six two, six two. <laughs> so yeah, I don't want to think about section six one anymore. 
It's probably the longest section in this course, right? Or almost as long as the introduction to tensor calculus or something like that. Well, so some of you may complain that my view of cosmology is just uh, a lot of differential geometry and not much physics. And a lot of courses would, of course, just completely skip what we've been doing so far, but say, well, this is the Friedman metric and let's see what happens. And you can spend a whole course discussing, uh, discussing it. Somehow I feel that if you are interested in, a, in the physics of a cosmological model, then you can always uh, try to, to go beyond what I said and just, uh, but at least you know how you got to this model, right? And so somehow I find it much more satisfactory to know what I'm doing than just somebody tells me, well, this is what, uh, what we assume and uh, good, well, it's up to you. Uh, sorry for those, disappoint those who would have preferred more physics and uh, happy to provide if you like doing it this way. So the next section would be 6.2, is it? I've already forgotten. Yeah, okay, thanks. And let's call it uh, cosmological principles. And there'll be an S in a parenthesis. And we start with a definition a congruence is a family of curves sat flat for every uh, for every point in our manifold, uh, there passes exactly one curve from this family. So if you go to an Italian restaurant and you get a, a, a dish of pasta, of spaghetti, then you have an example of congruence, right? On your, on your dish, right? So uh, every spaghetti is one curve and uh, through every point on your plate, uh, there is, passes exactly one. So, so congruence is a spaghetti dish. And of course, everything is differentiable here and so forth. So I'm not going to write these things. But so, so that is, uh, yeah, think of a spaghetti dish. And now the cosmological uh, principle one is one which we already discussed uh, called principle one. Would be, uh, there exists uh, a, a time function Uh, on our space time, so that uh, the level set of this time function are homogeneous and isotropic with uh, uh, 
homogeneous and isotropic level sets. And the claim is so the metric takes the form. There exists a coordinate system so that we can write the metric like that, where HK is our favorite maximally symmetric metric. So dr square. This is a one minus k r square plus r square d omega square. Now, let me write a cosmological principle too. There exists a um, congruence, a geodesic, a time like geodesic congruence such that the isotropy group of uh, of MG acts transitively on directions orthogonal to the congruence. So let me just uh, explain you the thinking behind this. Well, we are sitting in our galaxy and let's just think that uh, the galaxy is moving on a time like geodesic. Uh, so, or, so we are sitting on a time like geodesic in space time. It's freely falling, right? It's freely falling, there are no forces other than the gravitation on a large scale. So this galaxy is moving on a time like geodesic. And through every point of space time, every geodesic in the, our universe is moving on a geodesic. So we can, at every geo galaxy, or maybe at every point of our space time, imagine there is a time like geodesic passing through this point. And of course, we don't like this, ge this galaxies to heat to, uh, together too often for, uh, on average. So they're not, uh, there's only one curve through each point. There's, curves are not intersecting. And we are thinking that, well, because our universe looks isotropic in all directions, uh, then there is a group of isometries which maps all directions orthogonal to our world line. Uh, and because we're thinking we're not unique, preferred in the universe, then this will be true for every galaxy. Right? So we have this universe is filled by time like geodesics, world lines of galaxies, and every one of them is like us. The all directions are equivalent, right? So acting transitively in, in all directions means that there exists no, no preferred directions, orthogonal. Well, there is one which are these geodesics, but no preferred directions orthogonal to the congruence. So what we're going to do is to show that this cosmological principle too implies this form of the metric. I think this was our form two or, or something like that, right? Well, let's just restart the, the numbering. So this is the space-time form and this is the space part. 
So what is true that this cosmological principle too implies this claim. What is also true that this does not imply the claim. So if you, there are several books which you'll find the statement that from this, it follows that the metric has to take this form. And this statement, maybe some might people, some might find it more satisfactory uh, than this one philosophically. Uh, however, it does not imply this form of the metric. So even if it's more satisfactory or whether it's simpler to understand, it doesn't give this. This one gives you this. And therefore I like uh, this idea better. Uh, by the way, uh, this one also implies uh, uh, CP implies the claim, but also implies one, right? So CT2 actually implies one. So they're not contradiction. This is a slightly stronger assumption than this one. So what I'm going to do now is try to show that Cosmological principle two implies this form of the metric, the Friedman form of the metric. That's the plan for the next, uh, how many? 20 minutes, I don't think will be enough. Well, we'll see. But so if we don't finish this now, then uh, we'll continue next week. But well, maybe. Maybe it will be enough. So I, I try to be uh, to fit in, uh, in twenty five minutes. Maybe it will be a little faster than I tend to be. But So our aim, CP2 implies one and two. Good, so how does this go? Well, we have these curves. Uh, so let's see, so we have this S, gamma mu of S are in the uh, congruence, uh, one, so curves in the congruence. So we have uh, this family of curves, which is filling the space time. And uh, uh, let's say uh, u mu is the unit time like tangent, time like. Because these are, uh, and these are geodesics. Uh, so, uh, we have that u mu d mu uh, x uh, u alpha equals zero. So this is geodesic equation. We also have, well, uh, of course, I can lower the index. So I have d mu u alpha equals zero, which is the same. But we also have, so let's see, let's call this three. Uh, if we calculate this derivative, we also get zero because uh, u mu, if I just, well, if I calculate d alpha u mu u mu, then this is minus one because this is a field of unit vectors. So this whole thing is zero, but this is twice u alpha d alpha u mu um, not alpha but at mu here so so if i contract u with the matrix of first derivatives of u either on the first index, on the second one, I get zero. So we have 
um, this one, which is going to be important. Well, both are going to be important, but. Maybe I put numbers here because uh, that's uh, going to be used. So this is equation four. This is equation five. Now equation four is uh, important because it has this anti-symmetric uh, part of, uh, of U and this anti-symmetric part of U is something which has to do with the possibility of uh, uh, U being the gradient of something. So this is uh, our first step in this proof is going to be that U is a gradient. So we want to show that U is a, a gradient, right? So it exists tau so that U mu is its gradient. Now this equation, uh, which is going to be number six, now six is equivalent uh, to the equation that, uh, well, d nu d mu tau equals zero. Uh, well, this is an obvious thing. So, but uh, which is less obvious than uh, that d mu u nu equals zero. Right? Now this one is obvious because if there exists a function like that, then its second derivatives are symmetric. So, um, uh, so uh, this is just an integrability condition for this equation, right? So this is an integrability condition for this equation. And this one is actually true on simply connected manifolds. And uh, let's just assume this just to not to worry about. Uh, uh, other possibilities. Oh, assuming simply connected is simply connected might, might be just, this could be taken as a definition of simply connected, right? Simply connected means that if d mu nu is zero, then there exists a solution of six. So, um, good. Uh, of course, uh, so this has to do with four, right? Uh, so we look at, uh, we already know that part of this tensor um, d alpha uh, u mu is the same as d alpha u mu uh, because uh, this is just sigma alpha mu uh, u sigma and this is zero, right? So this is d alpha u mu. The Christoffels are symmetric. So if I anti-symmetrize, they drop out. So this equation that this is zero uh, is the same as the partial zero. And this is, we are back to the equation I wrote. So we already know that part of, of this anti-symmetric uh, derivative vanish, but uh, what about uh, orthogonal one, right? So let's take uh, take p in the manifold, and we just take uh, uh, e i. We are orthogonal to uh, to u at p, and we consider the tensor d i u j. So we just take the components of of u in this uh, basis, ui consider uh, orthogonal to u. 
So the claim is that this has to be zero. Well, otherwise, Uh, if it weren't, well, I can always do this. So just said ZK is epsilon chi AJ PI UJ. I'm running out of water in my device here, so which means that I've uh, been writing a lot today, much more than usual. And so there'll be a, an obvious good moment to stop when I will have run out of water. But um, there's still some left, so. Don't hope on finishing in two minutes. Yes. So this equation where epsilon is the usual uh, epsilon symbol, uh, then uh, this equation is the same as, uh, and I could probably put uh, uh, one half here just to, uh, to have the normalization, right? Epsilon i, j, k, z, k. Right, so we set this vector here. Uh, so uh, if this is not zero, uh, so z would be a we z would provide a preferred direction, right? Provide a preferred direction. Direction orthogonal to u. But there are no such directions. Right? But there are no such directions by hypothesis. Which means that di uj is zero, right? So from this formula here, so we define z like that, then z is zero, but from this formula then all the derivatives are zero. And we also know that u, uh, mu d mu u nu is zero, which is the same as saying, so say that d zero u i is zero in this frame, uh, in a frame and this is anti-symmetric, so it's all d mu u nu is zero. And on a simply connected manifold, we have our cosmological time function. So once we have this cosmological time function, we can uh, construct a good coordinate system by saying, well, let uh, tau be the first coordinate. And uh, we construct other coordinates by asking them to be constant along this congruence. So define coordinates uh, 
x mu by setting tau is x zero, so x zero is tau, and requiring um, u mu t mu x i equals zero, right? So which is saying x i are constant on the congruence, on, on the elements of the geodes, on the geodesics from the congruence. So what happened in this coordinate system? Uh, we have the equation uh, u mu u mu is minus one. Uh, u mu is uh, tau over mu. U mu app is also tau with the index raised. Now tau is x zero. So this is uh, g zero zero. And we have zero is equal u mu well, d mu x i, which is g mu nu tau over nu x i over mu. So this is g zero i, right? It's a delta i mu, and this is delta zero mu. So g zero i is zero, and g zero zero is minus one. Almost empty. So now the inverse metric is uh, minus one, zero, 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 and something here. But which means that if I take the inverse matrix, so the g mu nu we seen this is down, it's going, to, so this is block diagonal, so it's also going to be block diagonal. So in other words, the metric is minus dt squared plus gij dxi. And this should be uh, t is the same as now tau is the same as x0. Good. So now, of course, these are, these are maximally symmetric metrics. 
but that's not quite yet to the form we want because we don't know that there is this nice uh, product form that we had. So we need to do a little more work. And now we look at the tensor, uh, the, the symmetric part of, uh, of the covariant derivatives of U. which is uh, d u u nu plus, uh, and so these are indices down, so if I just put the Christoffels, gamma lambda mu nu uh, u lambda. Now, so this is uh, second derivatives of x naught over dx mu dx nu, which is obviously zero, plus gamma zero mu nu. Height u nu is delta nu zero in this coordinate system here. So we just need to show that these guys are, well, the claim is that these are zero. And we know, uh, so let's see, we don't know that this is zero yet, right? Okay, good. So we don't know what this is zero, this is zero yet. So let's calculate the gamma zeros here. The, the Christoffels. Three minutes to finish the proof. So three minutes, I will not do it, but I think that within uh, eight minutes, I will. So I'm sorry, I probably have to go five minutes over time, but at least we'll be done with this and we'll be able to do some physics next week. So this is zero, of course, and plus uh, gamma zero mu nu, which is uh, so one half G zero sigma D, uh, let's see, so how does this go? Uh, D uh, mu G sigma nu plus D nu G, uh, Sigma mu minus d uh, d sigma g mu nu. Now sigma the metric is diagonal, so sigma must be zero. So this is one half uh, minus one. Uh, D mu G zero nu plus D nu G uh, zero mu minus D zero G mu nu. Now this is zero, this is zero because the metric is a minus one and zero is here. So the only non-zero components are uh, the ij components, uh, so D, Uij is, we already know that this is zero, do we? We don't, no, we don't, do we? I'm completely confused now uh, with the logic here. Oh no, of course, this one, we don't know that it is zero, of course. Ah, right. So di dj is just minus, one half uh, minus one minus is a plus one half dt dij okay and so this one is there's no reason for this to be zero but the claim is uh, that di uj has to be proportional to 
to the metric, right? To the to to GIJ. And this is again an argument with uh, preferred directions, right? Because this is uh, the tensor, the matrix. If I take AIJ is GIK E K U J is symmetric. In a Riemannian metric with respect to which is Riemannian, or so in which is Riemannian. So it's diagonalizable. So we have this three by three matrix here, which is diagonalizable. Now I'm emphasizing here that this is a Riemannian metric because e for a Lorentzian one, that's not true anymore, right? So it's not true anymore that if you have a matrix which has, which is symmetric when the indices are down, then the, uh, then it's, uh, but the metric is uh, Lorentzian or pseudo Lorentzian uh, in general, then it's not true in general that it's going to be diagonalizable. Right, so I has to be a little careful about this, but in the Riemannian case, well, this is something you know from uh, freshman algebra. Now, because this matrix is uh, diagonalizable, it has eigenspaces and eigenvalues. And Well, so then you have either AAJ has three distinct eigenvalues, then three preferred eigenspaces. Not possible, right? Because each eigenspace would give you a preferred direction, and we don't have any preferred direction. So AIJ can have two distinct eigenvalues. But then and then at least one is one dimensional, right? So one of them is one of them has a one-dimensional eigenspace. Again, not possible. So then uh, AAJ has so all, all eigenvalues are equal. So then this matrix is proportional to the identity, right? So AAJ is. A constant, uh, which can depend upon T, delta IJ. And we're almost finished. So G I K D uh, K J U J, uh, which we decided was one half G I K D T G K J is C of T delta I J. 
So if I multiply it by gik, then this is the same as dt gij is c of t, uh, well, twice uh, gij, which is the same as saying that gij of t by integration is x of uh, integral from t0 to t to c of s ds gij of t0. Uh, now this one is a maximally symmetric, so we can write it as r square of t0 times a function our hk. And so gij is, we call all this r square of t hk. And so the space-time metric is minus dt square plus r square of t hk. Sorry about going over time. And this is finally the Friedman form of the metric. I manage in five minutes 30 over time. Okay, so let's say I started a little late, so five minutes is okay. Any questions? Uh, can you repeat uh, the argument why um, the cases where three distinct eigenvalues um, and two distinct eigenvalues occur are not possible? If you have three distinct eigenvalues, you have three distinct eigenvectors, right? And so each, uh, each of these eigenvectors gives you a preferred direction. But we assume that there is a group of isometries acting on the space times so that there is no preferred directions orthogonal to the congruence. There is one direction which is preferred, that's the congruence, there's no question about it, but there are no direct preferred directions orthogonal to the congruence. So you can't have a one-dimensional eigenspaces. Right? One-dimensional one eigenspace gives you uh, a preferred direction, so if of them would give you one. If you have two distinct eigenvalues, then we're in dimension three, so either one of them has to have dimension, one of them has to have dimension one, the other two, right? The, the eigenspace. So the one dimensional gives you a preferred direction. So they must be equal, but then whether they're equal in dimension three, then it's proportional to the metric. And uh, if you look at the lecture notes, I, I'm not sure what happened there, but this part of the argument in the lecture notes is, is, is written in a very strange way. So please just ignore what is uh, in my lecture notes. I mean, that's the one line proof of, of a statement which is written in an extremely complicated way and obscure way in, in my notes. So. All right, so once again, so we just, uh, uh, this tensor is just the time derivative of the metric, we just saw this, uh, and it is a constant times the identity matrix, so if you multiply by the inverse metric, you're going to get that the time derivative of the metric is, with this two, we get a two here, uh, twice uh, this, and this is the solution of this equation. If I differentiate this, I get the two C here, and uh, this metric is max. Oh, okay. This metric is isotropic uh, at every point, right? This metric is isotropic at every point. And this is something we saw last time. Isotropic every point means maximally symmetric. It's maximally symmetric. We show that we can write it as a rescaling factor times this HK metric. We call this whole thing R square of T, and we have our form of the metric. Good. So we're going to uh, look at Einstein equations for such metrics uh, next week and uh, see what are the 
cosmological consequences of this. Thanks a lot and see you next week. See you then. Bye. Yeah, bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.